Hello folks, I am Tara Wheeler Van Black. Um, this is Tara Talks today. Today I'm talking about cyberbullying and handling online harassment as a female in technology. Uh, for very obvious reasons, I've turned off the Q&A feature today and I'll tell you a little bit more about why that is a little bit later on here. So this is going to be much shorter than usual. I'm going to talk about probably 12 to 18 minutes today and then wish you all a lovely week. All right. Uh, first of all, to answer, and by the way, I've turned off Twitter, so tough. Uh, to answer any questions about why it is that I'm doing this conversation, I want to tell you first that this is going to be a talk based in reality. I am uninterested in debating whether or not online harassment exists. I'm uninterested in whether or not um, you think it's right or wrong right at the moment. I am simply and only going to discuss how you avoid, accept, deal with, handle online harassment. That's it. And some of this advice is going to, it's going to be problematic for people who have a crusade to go on. I don't. I just want to see you be safe and, and understand what your choices are when you're online. So uh, next thing to note is you can ask me questions after this at, at Tara on Twitter. Um, that's T-A-R-A-H. Okay. First of all, let's just start with the assumption that online harassment is real. Let's second go to what my experience with this has been. First of all, I, uh, I ran a Kickstarter in the summer of 2012. It's the reason that I got involved in a lot of, of this right here, why I'm doing this broadcast even now. I'm pouring my tea right at the moment. Today is Lady Grey with no caffeine whatsoever in it because I don't need it right now. I'm already hyped, hyped up enough. That was a campaign to put on a series of seminars for women in technology to teach them how to do how to get jobs, how to do technical interviews, what to handle when they were there. And we experienced a profound amount of harassment, doxing. We got DDoSed um, in the middle of our Kickstarter campaign. It brought a lot of attention to us, and at the same time, it was my first experience with having death and rape threats emailed to me on a regular basis. I had some pretty disturbing imagery happen. I had some in real life experiences that were not very pleasant. And there's a couple of things to remember about this. Let me just let me tell you what happened when I tried to report this to the Redmond police. I'm in Redmond, Washington. Um, normally you won't hear me admit my physical location at any given point in time, but I'm here so no burglars. What I do, I called the Redmond police and I got um, a young police officer, probably the, you know, a newbie on the job, and tried to explain to him that I was facing an issue where people were posting pictures of me online, where people had seen me in the streets, and um, where I had faced some personal physical issues of stalking. I explained that my house had, had pictures of it, um, that I'd been doxxed that I had constant death and rape threats showing up in my email inbox. And the officer took a brief moment. He searched me and said, this, I swear to God, these, this direct quote, so you're just putting yourself out there for anybody to see? And I was like, what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean putting myself out there? And I said, I'm, I'm online. I, I'm a web developer. And he said, I see your resume posted here online. You posted your personal information for anybody to see. What did you think would be the result? Um, and I want to make very clear to you that that last question was not rhetorical. It was not sarcastic. It was a genuine question from a young, I've, I've been calling him the 23-year-old buzz cut in my head for the last two years. Um, but he's, he's just some kid that didn't know. He wanted to know why I'd done something as stupid as post my resume online so anybody could contact me. So you have to understand this is not something where the police are deliberately trying to to harass or cause problems for women they genuinely don't understand why anybody would would expect anything different if you're a woman there's no law against this so he referred me to a Seattle detective to handle the issues of personal stalking that I'd, I'd experienced in Seattle and the Seattle detective that was that he referred me to never called me back after about four calls um, I found out later that I needed to call the FBI and then the FBI just there was there was no way through the bureaucratic maze. So what my experience was basically was that 
there's no protection for me whatsoever. The cops don't understand and don't get the fear that you're going to face with online and in real life harassment. We're solely going to talk about online harassment right now. So I want to tell you what it's like to report online harassment. Um, you just heard what it's like to, to report it to the physical police. They say, and this is the big key here, I don't know where it's coming from, so I can't, I can't do anything about it. They just basically say they've got no jurisdiction. Mm. Now, jurisdiction is a really interesting question. And the first thing you have to realize is if someone's going to report issues of online harassment, it would be good for them to be under 18. The only real initiative that the government has set up is cyberbullying.gov. And that's for kids, from what I can tell looking at the website. Uh, that has to do with when teenagers are being bullied, probably almost more a resource for parents who just want to know that the government's doing something, really. So I looked there and I didn't see anything there that would let me do something like report an online sustained um, a, amount of harassment against me because I had social media profiles active. So it's that's not the right place to report it, and it's it really is directed at kids. It's an, an attempt to prevent teens um, teen suicide. So what's the next thing that you could do? Uh, you could there, there's no real physical location to report this kind of abuse to. You could have people who are sending you rape threats from. Um, from from whatever country you can imagine, and as long as it's not the United States, there's no jurisdictional question here. There's there's nothing anybody can do. So what happens if you report it to individual services? Uh, I looked then at reporting to Twitter, and there was nothing that they could do then. Uh, the in the meantime, the woman who was really harassed, I believe it was about um, replacing a currency image with a uh, with a respected woman in Britain she was attacked on Twitter and it was her case that caused Twitter to create a report abuse form and, and situation the the report abuse form is about 20 questions long and you have to do it with every single person who tweets you I think you might have to do it for every single tweet to report abusive tweet you can't report an abusive person as far as I know in contrast, and I learned this on Twitter this morning, the spam button is one click. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, Facebook. Actually, Facebook wasn't that bad. Um, I could block anybody that caused me issues on Facebook, and I did that up until about the summer of 2012. Just before the summer, just before we ran the Kickstarter, I looked at what I was doing and, and I realized I was going to be higher profile. I didn't realize how high profile. Realized I was going to be higher profile and changed all my social media accounts over to what I would expect the public to be able to see. I opened up my Facebook and my Twitter accounts. I made it uh, so that anybody could see what I'm doing in, in those accounts. Anyone can follow me. Um, I friend or let anybody follow me on Facebook. And I purged my account first. I got rid. My mom didn't understand this. Neither did my dad. My my husband did, but that's because I got to them for to him first. Um, I removed their relationships from me on Twitter so that there was no convenient link for me to a family member that someone else could harass. And then removed all the pictures that I could think of that would be problematic. And I can't help it. There's just some toga party pictures up there that are never coming down. Hey, I had a good time. Um, and then I was fine with it. You can handle it in a great deal if you've got your own personal pro your own personal profile page. You can block people that are a problem if you don't want to do that. Um, if you have a fan page, you can't. Um, you may be the person who owns it. You may not be the person who owns it. In many of the cases of online harassment I've seen, the women in, in question did not own their own Facebook fan pages. So a piece of advice, own your own Facebook page. I registered Facebook.com, Tara Wheeler, Van Vlack, the, the public persona page, and now I just have it unpublished. I own it so nobody can get to it, and I just ignore it. Since Facebook has the follow feature, I just leave that up there for everybody. Okay. So realize that most abuse happens where you can't do anything about it. Uh, Anita Sarkeesian, and she's certainly the most famous example of someone I can think of who has dealt with this kind of abuse much much more than I have. Um, she actually gave a um, 
she she was she was targeted on multiple sites that she had no control or connection to. So there would be po uh, pictures and posters of her as porn um, put on Reddit, um, some sites like that, 4chan, um, MRA sites, things like that. That's and that's men's men's rights activists sites, and those are the same kinds of sites that. Um, the the boy who killed those girls in, in Santa Barbara was at a lot. Um, Wikipedia as well. The funny part about Wikipedia is that you cannot prevent abuse on your own profile page. So Anita Sarkeesian had her, her Wikipedia page defaced and had porn images and all kinds of nasty stuff put up there. Ironically, Wikipedia has a, a policy about if they find out that you own your own page, they may, they may get rid of your page forever. So you have to realize that most of the stuff that's going to happen out there, if it does happen in a campaign, you'll never be able to control. And if you did report it to those sites, you would go through a lengthy process of proving you were you before they did anything, if they ever responded to you whatsoever. So the question here is, what do you do? Do you accept or do you reject what's going on? I chose, or do, well, more avoid or accept, I think is a better way to put it. I chose to accept and just turn off the notifications for most of the things that would involve harassment for me. I can't turn off the fact that I get an email every so often that says, I'm going to nail your face, bitch. Um, I, I can't turn that off, but I do my best to make a personal game out of it and ignore it. Um, I figure out a way to spam it. I report it if I see something relevant. And to the guys that email me from your employer email accounts, no, dude. You deserved it, okay? Hmm. So, I think a lot of a lot of women don't realize. And I got to note, I am talking mostly about women here because there is a profound amount of online violence that happens towards non-traditionally gendered people. But I haven't seen the same kind of issues happen with ethnic minorities. So I'll say that this is commonly directed at women, and you'll often find if someone is out as queer or non-traditionally gendered online, that they will face the same kind of harassment. So you, I, I think a lot of people don't realize when they're afraid to put their, their personal information up online. And by that, I mean some way to contact you, like your email address or your phone number. It, first, if you're going to be online, and that's going to be your job, you're going to be a web developer or you're going to be a DBA or something along those lines, you will have to have a way to contact you. Your LinkedIn information, I should be able to email you if I'm trying to recruit you. And I think that a lot of women are much more scared than they need to be when it comes to having their online information up. Unless you have some kind of personal thing going on, your online information is very unlikely to end up in the hands of anybody who would do anything other than spam you with really bad recruiter ads. So I think that a lot of women think of, of harassment as this constant, just happens to everybody. It truly doesn't. It didn't happen to me really until I hit that until I did that Kickstarter and came to to people's notice. So in when I've encouraged people in the past to put your information up online, I do I do mean it. And I mean that for almost everybody. What I'm mostly talking about here is if you are thinking about as a woman or a non-traditionally gendered person or queer, you're thinking about putting your information out there and you're going to deliberately court being more high profile, this is what to expect and how to fix it. If you're going to deliberately choose to have a blog that's popular or a Twitter account that you expect a lot of followers for and you want it public, you could choose to avoid this altogether by being anonymous in some fashion. The truth is this is going to happen to you. It will. There's nothing you can do about that. It depends on what level of fame you're at and what subject area you're, ta you're tackling. Um, women who tackle botany and have 10,000 Twitter followers aren't going to see the same kind of harassment that a woman who talks about feminism and technology with 500 Twitter followers will have. So that's, that's just the way that it goes. If you are someone who's famous online and you have, and you're, it's, it's going to happen. There's not a there's not a good way around it, but to tell you that, and figure out now if you want to try to avoid or accept. Uh, let's see here. So when I decided I was going to basically accept that this was going to happen, I first I had no idea how bad it would be. I still am struck sometimes by the the malice behind some of the stuff that I get sent, and yet at the same time, like my husband likes to say, I've I've developed the hard candy shell now. So. 
Um, and for those of you who've heard me holler about one or two of the things that have, that have happened over the course of the last couple of years, what can I say? Sometimes this stuff does get to me. I'm hoping this will be of use to, um, to women and people who are queer and non-traditionally gendered when they make these decisions too. So I took, I decided to accept this. The first thing I did was I, like I said before, made all my public profiles public, public. I just accepted that anything I posted was going to go everywhere. I have Hootsuite, for instance, and I post to like six different accounts, my LinkedIn, my Twitter, my Facebook, all at the same time, uh, recognizing that if I don't want it posted on LinkedIn, I shouldn't post it on Twitter anyway, right? The second thing I did was I made a decision, and this is a personal one, to not curate anything. I don't curate my Facebook page. I don't boot friends out. I don't see a lot of what goes on on my profile because I check in every once in a while and look at notifications and messages but I don't see most of what happens on my own Facebook page now because that's often a target for people. So I, I just have it all public at this point and I keep my private life offline basically. Um, realize that Anita Sarkeesian disagrees with me on this point. I heard her speak right after the, the big Kickstarter issue um, her Kickstarter issue in October, I think, of 2012, and I met and talked with her there then and, and asked her about this curating issue. She likes to say that your web space is your web space and you can curate, kill comments, block people if you want to. I tend to think that that means they've won instead of you, and plus, I don't have the energy to tell other people what they can and can't say online, even in my own personal space, because if it's online, it's not really my personal space anymore. So, I mean, there's people that are going to disagree with me on this, but this is, this is how I feel about it. So you're not going to see me curate or delete things anymore that are harassing or problematic towards me. I don't have the energy or the time to do it. So, um, and I, I hope that my attitude ends up profiting me in the long run. I know that it helps for me not to have those notifications sent to me when, when bad crap happens. Um, you remove a lot of the power from people when you do that, and that will really help. Now there's a caveat to this. If something in real life, in, in your physical space is happening, you do need to report it to the police. Um, realize what your rights are. If you have something physically happening, someone is in real life threatening you, and by this I don't mean someone that is in another country emailing you and saying that they're going to come to your house and um, I'm not going to use some of the graphic language that I've experienced, but assume that you're getting graphic death and rape threats. The police have no, they, there's nothing they can do about it. If someone is physically near you, if they are in your jurisdiction, you have to know the jurisdiction. So if I knew someone who was in Seattle and was physically harassing or threatening me or was sending me these emails, the cops could do something. But welcome to virtual private networks. You know, if, if you have hidden your IP address, there's really not anything they can do. Um, so you won't be able to, what is it? Oh, yeah, you can't prove clear and present danger. That's what it is. Um, you have to prove a present and ongoing danger to your safety or well-being by someone who's physically close to you. Then you've got rights. Otherwise, you've got no rights. Um, you, you may end up doxxed. You may end up with your public documents public. There's, there's not much you can do about it, so be aware of this. It has been my experience that only a few of the people that have contacted me and harassed me have been actually dangerous. That doesn't help a lot. I can't give you a percentage. And I know that if you're in the situation and you found this video after starting to experience this, then, you know, bless you, honey. I'm sorry. But a lot of this can be helped with a solid emotional core and that hard candy shell, which does come pretty soon. I promise. Um, be secure in yourself, though, and that last piece that I will tell you is uh, if your home information goes up, uh, you need to make sure that your home is as secure as possible. One of the things that I never, ever do is I never say precisely where I am at it. Oh, no, I never say precisely where I will be at a point in time. So I may say, hey, I'm going to be, you know, at DEF CON this year, but that's a situation where I've always made sure that my home and my life are safe as I'm not, you know, if I'm not in a position to make sure of it myself. So that's the best advice I have for you. Um, there are going to be people who watch this who are mad about the fact that I didn't go on some kind of harangue about the people that are doing this. Guess what? There's nothing I can do about that. 
these are the things that in reality you experience as a woman who has some degree of, of a public persona on the internet. And I don't even have that much of one compared to some of the women and the campaigns that I've seen. So hopefully this will provide some information for you and I wish you the best of luck. If you want to reach me personally, please email me at t at theterra.com and I'll do my best to find you some resources in the area or point you at someone who can help you. I know that it feels, you feel very alone right now and you're not. Other people have experienced it and I'm alive and happy and drinking really, really good tea right now so this too will pass, I promise. I wish you the best of weeks and we're going to talk again next week where I will actually allow people to, talk to, to ask me questions again because I didn't want to do it this time. And I hope you have a lovely week. So thanks. Have a good time.